Hey guys, what's up? This is Eric from Gun Gamers, and uh, as you can see, I am packed for Milsim West Return to Saratov, which I will be attending with my friends over at Task Force Keg. If you're not aware, that is a 10th Mountain Impression group started by my buddy Corey, along with Garrett and Ian, all members of Gun Gamers and all solid dudes, obviously. So I'm very excited to run this kit, but uh, this is not really about that. This is about answering one of the most common questions I see. Uh, I have written an article about this that I wrote for the bbwarrior.com, which I'll link for uh, down below. I have talked about this in numerous Facebook groups and answered questions about this all the time. Um, so I'm just going to go over it in video form because, of course, as soon as I got everything packed, I remembered that I have to do a virtual layout. So what I'm answering is what I pack for a 40-hour Milsim event. This is everything that I'm going to be bringing with me and carrying into the AO with me, and it is quite a doozy, as you can see. Um, but there is a method to the madness, and I think as I break it down and explain how I have everything put together, maybe you'll find some ways that uh, you can prepare for any upcoming events you're planning to attend. Maybe if you've never been to a 40-hour Milsim event before, this can be helpful if you're looking to go in the future. Or maybe as I'm going through this, I'll find some things I can improve upon. I'm always learning and always uh, finding new and interesting ways to change things up, so we're going to see what happens. But without further ado, uh, let's get into talking about this. And one of the first things I want to go over is kind of how I delineate what gear is what. Uh, so if you're familiar with the first line, second line, third line theory as it comes to you know military gear and loadout uh, discussion, your first line are the things that you always have on you, the things you don't leave home without. Your second line is your fighting load. And your third line is your sustainment gear. Um, I think that applies pretty well to Airsoft, and I kind of talk about it when I talk about it with people in a different way, where your first line is your base Airsoft gear. This is the stuff you need to play Airsoft. If you're going out for a 15 to 30 minute game, this is the stuff you have with you. Your second line in this context is then going to be your long-term Airsoft gear. This is the gear that you're gonna have with you for you know six to eight hours at a time. This is the stuff you wanna have on your body for most of the event, if it's a you know longer event. And then you've got your third line, which is still your sustainment gear. The stuff that you wanna have with you so that you can actually stay in the field for 40 hours at a time and not have to go back to your car or rely on anything like that. Um, some non-negotiables, the absolute basic non-negotiables you're always going to have to have with you. Um, I always wear a watch to Airsoft. This is not my Airsoft watch. This is the watch I wear every day uh, in my normal life. But I always wear a watch to Airsoft, so that is not something I'm going to forget. But when I leave to go drive to the game, I just put on the watch I plan to wear in the field, and I just wear that for the entire weekend. So... Non-negotiable number one is you always need a watch. Uh, Non-negotiable number two is I always bring a pocket knife to these types of things, but also I carry a pocket knife in my daily life, so I'm not going to forget that. Uh, but then we get into the other non-negotiables, things that I have seen people forget. Boots. Eye protection. There's not a single airsoft event you are going to go to that allows you onto the field without these two things. Good footwear, appropriate footwear, and eye protection. Uh, my eye protection is Oakley M-Frame Alphas with the Helo kit. Not everyone runs Helo kits in these. I know AMS and Milsim West allow you to use M-Frames without the Helo kits, but call me paranoid, I like having the Helo kit in. I do not advocate running non-full seal eye protection, and that doesn't change just because some event rules disagree with me. Uh, then for boots, I have my Solomons. These are waterproof hikers. Uh, I really like these boots. They're very comfortable. They fit my feet very well, which can be tricky sometimes to find boots that fit well, but these fit great. They're very comfortable, and I love them. Uh, I'm not going to go into as much detail with everything that I have, but I just really wanted to hammer home the importance of having a really good set of trustworthy eye protection and comfortable, broken-in, high-quality boots. I personally recommend waterproof boots for most contexts, but if you've got enough experience that you have reasons you don't prefer that, then you can pick whatever boots you want because you obviously know what you're doing and know what your feet like. And of course, you've got your 
uniform and I lay out everything well ahead of time so that I have, again, I'm not gonna forget anything. I always wear uh, good wool hiking socks to any event. I think that good thick wool hiking socks, while they might make your feet too warm in some context, um, I find that they keep my feet just right, but maybe that's because I like having my feet nice and cozy. But more importantly, they keep my feet blister free and dry. And that's why I really advocate wool socks. Even if they're thinner wool socks, whatever, just have good wool socks. I uh, also wear compression short type underwear, which I won't go into too much detail on that. And I know you didn't tune into this video to hear me talk about my nether regions. Uh, but <laughs> then of course you've got the base layer shirt, which uh, this is the TF Keg sand shirt with the uh, TF Keg insignia on it. So. That's what I'm wearing for my base layer. Uh, this is a 100% cotton shirt, which is very good at moisture wicking. I definitely recommend 100% uh, cotton or some other form of really good athletic blend of t-shirt. Uh, depends on your own style and, well, style, not really, your own comfort level, your own preferences. Then of course you need a uniform appropriate for the event and appropriate for your faction. So I am wearing a ACU cut set of multicam because that is accurate to the impression that I am running. And these are some Fracu pants with a proper ACU top. And that is the basic stuff. Uh, then of course, a belt, I'm just using a riggers belt. It's a riggers belt I've had forever. It works for whatever, there you go. So those are your non-negotiables. Those are the things you absolutely should have out and ready, and those should be in your car on their own so that you can visually confirm the entire time that you have them. I recommend putting those in their own bag and having those out and visible well before the event so that you don't show up for getting any of those things because maybe you can source spares of some things, but a good proper fitting uniform, good proper fitting boots, good eye protection, and of course, underwear and socks. Those are things you don't want to be scrambling for last minute. Do not forget those things. Uh, now, I actually do something weird. And before I even get to the event, I like to place some things that I know I'm gonna to wanna to have with me on my person at the event in the pockets that I want them at in at the event. And maybe this is a weird thing, maybe no one else does this, but I like doing it. So in my left pocket, I have some extra sets of hearing protection, I have my notepad, and I have a pen. And those are things that I really wanna have because you know, you should have those things at any Milsim event, uh, especially the ear hearing protection because there's blank fire at Milsim West. And I also have some extra anti-fog wipes. Anti-fog is your friend. I recommend these FogTech DX wipes. I get a lot of questions about those too. So FogTech DX. Really good anti-fog wipes. I have really good luck with them with my M-Frame Alphas, and I find that I have very little fog unless we get into temperature extremes, or if it's been quite a while and then the anti-fog treatment wears off, you know, 12 to 15 hours after applying it. Um, so those are things I like having with me always. And then of course, in my other pocket, just by itself, you can see peeking out, I have my first Milsim West tourniquet. And that's the one that I'm always gonna have on me. So even if I ditch the plate carrier, and I'm taking advantage of the armor rules at this Milsim West. So even if I ditch the plate carrier, which has my second tourniquet, I always have my first tourniquet, and I can always get healed back into the game, and it's really easily accessible in my shoulder pocket. So then we get into the pants, and some things that I always try to keep with me are my primary set of hearing protection, which are in my left pocket. I have my primary set of hearing protection. I have some hand sanitizer. And then I also have actually a broken down MRE accessory packet. And the reason I have this is because I've got some instant coffee, some moist towelettes, some gum, and some emergency toilet paper in here. And I find that those are just things I like to have handy just in case. Uh, every now and then the emergency toilet paper could potentially come in handy. So I like having that just in my pocket, never know. Sometimes there's emergencies out in the field and you just gotta dig a cat hole and use what you got. <laughs> uh, then in my right pocket, for when I wanna ditch the helmet during patrol base operations, I have my boonie cap, which is a little buried in here. Boonie cap, appropriately sized and appropriate for the uh, faction color and for the uh, impressions, just a military surplus boonie. 
I have a net gaiter. Uh, then I also have my mechanics gloves. And all these things are within that uniform that I'm not forgetting, right where I'm gonna wanna have access to them, just so that I don't forget them and I know where they are. And I will put those back in where they go after I get done filming this. So those are my basic level one, always gonna have them, always gonna have those on my person. That's my EDC for this event. That's my everyday carry. Those are the things that I don't get out of my sleeping bag without. Then of course, you can't forget your gun. This is uh, the GNP Mark 46, fresh off of a, an entirely new gearbox install. I actually put a Lonex Complete Version 2 gearbox in here and an ASG motor. These internals were cursed. Even after the video I did on it, this thing continued to have issues. So I just replaced the entire freaking internal set. And it seems to shoot great now. So fingers crossed that it uh, makes it through the event. We'll see what happens. Uh, then I also have it configured in whatever appropriate configuration, but you always need your weapon. Uh, then you get into your fighting load, and this is your level two. These are the things that you wanna have, you, have with you during any type of patrol operations, any type of firefight. This is the thing that I'm gonna take off when I get into my sleeping bag and put back on pretty much as soon as I get out and any time we're anticipating contact, or if possible, when we get into contact. Now I can grab that Mark 46 and whatever else I've got and be pretty effective. I've got 3000 BBs in that fricking box mag or however much I have at the event. I've got whatever ammo is in there. I can fight long enough with that to get to this if I need to. But if I'm going out on any patrol operations, that's what I'm gonna want to have my actual fighting load, which is entirely contained in my plate carrier. Now, a lot of people will run assault packs with a plate carrier chest rig because then they can have their assault pack as their short-term sustainment gear along with whatever they've got in their plate carrier chest rig. And that often works well with a uh, lighter weight or lower capacity plate carrier chest rig. This is a KDH SPCS. This thing is an absolute brute. I did not want to have to mangle or manage having an assault pack in addition to having this and my ruck. So what I decided on instead is I would take advantage of the molly space that this offers and I would put everything I need for six to eight hours at a time on this. So I've got an extra box mag for my Mark 46 on here. And the reason I have that is because I don't wanna be caught in the middle of a firefight and have my box mag go down and be unable to continue engaging. Uh, the most common failure point on most MGs in my experience is the box mag itself. Those love to break and burn out at the worst times. So I have a whole extra box mag in here. Plus, because of the rules at Milsim West, if somehow I come into enough ammo or our squad comes into enough ammo and makes the decision to just top off the machine gun, I have 6,000 BBs of capacity between these two box mags and ammo cannot be looted from magazines at Milsim West. So having a high capacity of magazines for your squad automatic weapon means that not only do you have that much non-lootable ammo, but that non-lootable ammo is on tap for your highest casualty producing weapon. So specific to machine gunner theory, I think that this is a really good move for these types of games. And I think it's pretty actively encouraged within the rule set. Then in this other pouch, I just have my pyro. You know, I love having pyro. I actually plan on picking up more before this event. And then I have, on via shot cord on my SPCS, I have my second Milsim West tourniquet because again, with armor rules, with this helmet and with this plate carrier, which has, yes, weighted plates uh, and soft armor, <laughs> with this setup, I'm allowed to have two tourniquets. So this is my second tourniquet. As soon as I ditch the plate carrier, that second tourniquet goes with it. I'm no longer eligible with the rules to use that second tourniquet. So that second tourniquet only comes with me when the plate carrier does. And of course I have a multi-tool and some markers just in case. Then in terms of the rest of my short-term sustainment gear, I have a medical kit in here, which is a trauma kit and then a boo-boo kit. And I have a real tourniquet on here uh, for two reasons. One, it's kind of part of the impression. Uh, it looks 
good to have a real tourniquet next to an IFAC. But number two, there are real firearms on site at Milsim West. And having a real tourniquet and knowing how to use it, uh, especially when you are like me, running with some people who are actually EMT certified. So even if it's like a crazy grievous injury that I can't do anything super well with, I have this extra equipment that maybe they can use it or God forbid they can use it on me. Uh, but because there are real firearms present at Milson West in the form of blank fire, I like to be prepared with a trauma kit and a tourniquet just in case. Uh, I doubt anything's gonna happen ever because nothing has happened to this point, but accidents can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. It's better to be, uh, it's better to be prepared for them. Then, of course, on this side, I have some snacks, just a few protein bars that are in this M4 pouch. And I just like having a little bit of food on me so that if we're on a patrol for a while, I can get some calories, get some uh, sugar, get some protein, get some quality, quality food in me, you know, just in the form of basically candy bars with a little bit of whey in them. But they do help with uh, keeping your energy up just as you're going. And if you're away from your ruck and you don't have a good opportunity to get a real meal in. And in this pouch here, I have my spare batteries and my night vision equipment. I do not recommend you leave your night vision equipment with your ruck. Uh, this is something that I have come to really appreciate the more that I hear horror stories about theft from more and more people. Uh, if you are bringing night vision to an event, I highly recommend that you keep that night vision on your person at all times for the, you know, gameplay pragmatic reason of, well, what if it gets dark while well, I'm out on a long patrol? Now I've got my night vision with me. And for the real life pragmatic reason of, I paid a lot of money for this. And if someone steals this while I'm away from my ruck, I'm going to be really, really upset about it. So I keep that on my person at all times, non-negotiable. And finally, the last thing that I use for sustainment is just a camelback. Uh, so this camelback is about a two liter capacity. So that's about two liters of water. That should more than easily keep me going for hopefully, you know, four to six hours until I've got a good chance to refill. Plus medic water at Milsim West. So this could even probably stretch beyond that if I have to get revived a couple of times between getting out, getting out with a full bladder and going back to my ruck for refill. So that is my fighting load for this event, my second line. Ah, and of course, you got the helmet. This is an ACH with the camo netting and a UCP cover and a rhino arm, accurate to the impression and set up so that I can use my night vision with it. Pretty self-explanatory. Highly recommend Team Wendy pads. There we go. Also, of course, running a real ballistic helmet in combination with the weighted plates in the SPCS. That does mean I get to take advantage of the second tourniquet armor rule at Milsim West, as previously discussed. Uh, in my opinion, if you're going to a 40 hour Milsim event and they don't have armor rules and you're not using night vision, there is no good reason to run a plate carrier and helmet. Uh, if there's no armor rules, a plate carrier is a fashion choice, not a practical choice. It's a choice I've still made on many occasions, but uh, just know that if you're looking for ways to lighten the load, that should be your first sacrifice. Get rid of the plate carrier, get yourself a chest rig, and get rid of the helmet, get yourself a ball cap or anything else. Maybe even bring the helmet with you and just put that on just for nighttime. I've done that before. Those are good ways to lighten the load if you have good practical reasons for doing so, and if there's no good practical reason for having those things. And then finally, we get into the third line, the sustainment gear, the rucksack. So I have this set up kind of in an interesting way where you can access most everything you're really going to need quickly without having to unpack the entire thing. This is a Hill People Gear Umlindi. Uh, Hill People Gear makes a lot of like backcountry backpacking type of gear. Uh, I know that not everyone's gonna recommend them for a militaristic setting, and this is definitely a little bit farby as far as the impression is concerned, but fuck you, I like this pack, I'm gonna use it, and I'm not gonna be wearing it for 90% of the event, so it won't even break your immersions that much. Uh, but this pack is uh, really well set up for being able to just get in and 
get what I need without having to disturb all of the contents. Now, obviously I have a sleeping pad. That is something that you should never be without for a 40 hour event. Uh, do not try to go without an ISO mat. The ground will suck the heat out of your body and you will get extremely cold and at best be uncomfortable, at worst be hypothermic. Do not go to an event without a sleeping pad, some type of sleeping pad. This is a thermo rest, it's durable, it's cheap, it's semi-light even if it's bulky and I like it. Then on the bottom here, I have in a stuff sack that came with my old sleeping bag or mat, I have my entire sleeping setup or a setup that I can use for sleeping. So within here, I have a Wooby, a bivy sack, and a tarp shelter with paracord for setting it up. Now, this is a little bit of a pain to get everything out and restuff it in, so I'm just not gonna do that for the video. I can do it within just a few minutes, but I'm already gonna be unpacking this entire ruck for this video. You get the idea. So, bivy sack uh, is absolutely essential as well for having, uh, for a 40 hour event because the bivy sack is going to protect your sleeping bag or whatever you're using as a sleeping bag from the elements. And it's gonna keep you dry and it's gonna keep you safer from the wind than just having no other form of shelter. Sleeping bags are great until they get wet. And uh, that's whether you're using this Wooby, which is really more of a backup to me, uh, but I can use it in a pinch and then have a quick sleeping setup without entering my ruck. But I highly recommend having something more than a Wooby available because when temperatures get low, you really want to have something that's going to keep you really warm. The bivy sack to me is a non-negotiable though, and that should be combined with whatever sleeping bag you're using. And then I also use a snug pack stash of tarp shelter, and I have that in here just in case we have to set up outside and it's expected to rain. I have slept under the stars plenty of nights in just the bivy sack. You really don't have to focus on setting up a tarp shelter if it's a clear night, but I highly recommend absolutely having the bivy sack because you can sleep out in the elements in just the bivy sack if you close it all up, but you cannot sleep out in the elements in a sleeping bag. Even wind cuts down the effectiveness of sleeping bags significantly. There's a reason those are always combined with something else. <sighs> so that's another absolute non-negotiable for sustainment gear. And of course, we haven't even gone over the most important non-negotiable for sustainment gear, water. I pack in what could be argued to be a little bit too much water. Uh, a lot of people will recommend for Milsim West that you have a capacity of maybe three to five liters of water because water refills are generally pretty well accessible at these games. But <laughs> to quote a popular meme, I'm built different. I find that I need a lot of water. I'm six foot three, 255 pounds. I'm a sweaty man and I go hard and I'm wearing this stupid heavy plate carrier. So I actually, for this event, have seven liters of water capacity. I have these one quart canteens, which I guess are technically just under a liter, so six and a half liters, let's say. I have two one quart canteens on either side of my waist belt on my ruck which is just a little bit of a pain to show the camera right now, but trust me, I have them. And then I've got these liter and a half silos from Nalgene on either side of my ruck. And I can get to all of the water that I have with me without opening the ruck. I highly recommend figuring out a way that you can do that. And I also recommend you figure out a way that you can have the back of your plate carrier slick for when you have to ruck. And this is something I forgot to mention, but that Camelback as you might have noticed, is only secured onto my SPCS with Grimlocks. As a result, when I'm gonna be rucking in and out from, uh, you know, from PB to PB, I can take that Camelback off of that SPCS and secure the Grimlocks to the compression straps on my ruck. And as a result, I now have a clear, flat back under where I wanna put this ruck. So that helps me keep the weight closer to my body and distribute the load a little bit more comfortably. Definitely something to keep in mind. Now, in terms of what I actually have inside the ruck and what I'm gonna need to open anything to get into, I have this Terra pocket on the outside of my ruck. And when I zip that open, I have immediate access to 
some wet wipes and some toilet paper because as we discussed, emergencies sometimes happen. And also my toothbrush and some floss picks because air softers smell bad enough at Milsim West without the added help of halitosis. That's also what these wet wipes are really good for. If you get particularly grimy and you feel real gross, just give yourself a quick wet wipes bath and you'll feel five or six percent a little less gross. Uh, so. <laughs> You know, it helps, every little bit helps. Then in here, as my oh shit emergency pocket, I both have the oh shit supplies and the toiletry supplies. And I also have my wet weather gear and my cold weather layer. So this wet weather gear is a uh, Gore-Tex Multicam Parka made to military spec. This uh, has an NSN number, it's accurate to the impression, but I highly recommend some form of rain jacket, even if it's just a frog tog or some kind of crappy commercial rain suit. You absolutely need some form of rain gear. That is another non-negotiable for a 40 hour event, some form of rain gear. And then I have a uh, USGI fleece, and that is, again, to the impression spec, yada, yada, yada. But this is a cold weather layer. If it gets cold all of a sudden, I can open this pocket and get to my cold weather layer. And if I need to, I can also layer that with my wet weather layer. And I highly recommend you have things to layer under your wet weather layer because even if you have just a standard like rain jacket, a lot of times those aren't insulated super well. So if the rain starts sapping away your body heat because you don't have enough insulation between your body and the actual water running down the Gore-Tex layer, you're, gonna, you're still gonna be cold and miserable even if you're not wet. Highly recommend being able to layer these items. And then I just have a fleece watch cap, just because when it gets, if it gets colder at night, if I'm chilling, and if I don't have my helmet or my nods on, or if I'm just going to sleep, I can take everything off, put that watch cap on, and my ears and my head will be nice and warm and cozy, and it's a good time. And then finally, we open the main compartment of the ruck. The main compartment of the ruck is where I store the gear that is also some non-negotiables, but this is what I'm gonna be opening if I've got more time and I'm not trying to get at any of this super, super quick. Now my first priority, if I'm opening this and I've got some time, is I wanna have access to my main food. So I have some freeze-dried meals in here along with some uh, freeze-dried apple bits. I highly recommend bringing some type of dried fruit out into the field with you just so you get a better variety of nutrition than whatever's in your MRE or whatever's in those freeze-dried meals. Now these freeze-dried meals, uh, I get the ones that are pretty high in protein and have a good variety of vegetables in them. Like this is a breakfast skillet that has eggs, sausage, potatoes, and peppers. You know, pretty good nutritional breakdown there overall. And I've got this home style chicken and rice here, which has chicken, rice, vegetables, and a sauce. These taste pretty good, but they also give you a good variety of nutrition. A lot of people overlook having a good breakdown of the nutrition that they're gonna be consuming over the weekend at these games. Now, you should be hydrating and eating well in the weeks leading up to these games, really in your daily life. But if you can't bring yourself to do that for whatever reason, uh, then at least in the several weeks leading up to an event, you should be trying to eat a good, healthy, balanced diet, whatever that means for you. Uh, but you should be eating a good, healthy, balanced diet, getting plenty of macro and micronutrients of all the types that you need. And you should also be hydrating really, really well. You should be peeing clear. Uh, so I do both of those things for the most part in my normal daily life and I especially focus on them leading up to these events and I also recommend having things that have macro and micronutrient rich entrees as your food that you're going to be bringing into the field a lot of people will just make do with like kind of crappy food in my opinion and I just number one that's a morale sink I don't like eating crappy food while I'm out in the field number two you're just not gonna perform as well. Uh, I think it's better to have better food. I have a jet boil here for eating those freeze-dried meals. And in case I don't have quite as much time, I also have a broken down MRE, and that is a lot of food, you might notice. Uh, I am still considering whether or not I pare down the food slightly for this event in particular, but 
I would rather have too much food going into an event than too little because I never want to get to an event and feel like I don't have enough food and then I'm hungry. And again, morale sink, performance starts to go down. Uh, I really like making sure I have plenty of calories. So all good things to keep in mind. Then I have my cold weather sleeping bag. This is a 20 degree rated mummy down bag from L.L. Bean. Uh, I think it's a really, really great sleeping bag. There's a million different types that can be recommended, but a good compact sleeping bag, something you could actually pack down enough to put in your ruck and carry without having to have it like dangling awkwardly or uh, anything like that. I highly recommend having a good packable cold weather sleeping bag and a 20 degree rating to me is my minimum recommended because you can unzip the sides and make it sleep colder if you want, but you can't take a hot weather sleeping bag and make it warmer. At least not without significant layering, which requires carrying more. Then, of course, you have to have your garbage bags for Milson West because you need to carry out your garbage. Don't forget these. No one likes a dirty AO, especially if you're the one who made it. Uh, then I've got some more hand sanitizer in here. Again, 2020 and, you know, bathroom purposes. Uh, I have a lighter for using the jet boil, and I have a red Petzl light. This I'll actually put in my pocket as it gets dark because I like having the red Petzl light on me. But for most of the event, I don't really bother and I just leave it in the top of my ruck. Uh, but as, like I said, as it starts to get darker, I'll put the red Petzl light in my pocket. But for now, it just goes in the top of the ruck. And finally, at the absolute base of the ruck, uh, this is going to be a little bit tricky to get out because these water bottles do kind of pinch it which is why this is in the absolute bottom because this is the lowest priority item. I'm only breaking this out if I have the most time. I have a stuff sack and this stuff sack is something I'm only gonna be breaking out if I have plenty of time to sit down and take my boots off, take my shirt off or take my pants off because guess what? That's what's in here. I have an extra pair of pants. I have two extra pairs of underwear and I have two extra pairs of socks and I have an extra t-shirt in here. So I basically have a full change of base layer plus a change of pants. And the reason I have those is because pants rip, pants get soaked, uh, pants, you know, otherwise get compromised in a way that you might want to change them. Uh, underwear gets really, really gross after you've been sweating in it for 40 hours. So you might want to change that on a couple of occasions, again, to feel five or 6% less gross. Socks get really gross and sweaty socks and sweaty feet and wet socks can be a blister nightmare and cause a lot of other issues for your feet. So don't get trench foot, change your socks. And the spare base layer, again, feel less gross, feel better about yourself change your base layer, change your t-shirt. And if this was a colder event and an event where we were looking at maybe having down into the 20s, uh, then I would definitely have some extra cold weather layers in there as well. But in general, I try to have a uh, long sleeve base layer for events where it's gonna get really cold. Uh, and I will usually wear that in, but I also will have an extra set or if it's going to get that at night and it's not starting that uh, that cold, I'll put that in that stuff sack. But, wow, there we go. That is everything that I have packed for Milsim West Return to Saratov. It is uh, a lot of stuff, but as you can see when I actually have it packed, it's wearable and carryable and it's something that I have tested by putting all this shit on and going and rucking with it. Uh, I can carry all this for significant periods of time at a good pace, and it is not going to cause me injury or undue stress, and that's the last bit of preparation that is absolutely crucial to focus on is your physical preparation, uh, whether that be just getting all the stuff together and putting it on and making sure that you can wear it all and then maybe going and walking with it if you have a good opportunity to do so to really make sure that you can carry it. Uh, whether that be getting yourself into some sort of shape so that you can complete the event successfully to the level that you want to complete it. Obviously, you know, you can play the game more as a uh, conservative type of role and not have to do hard charging all the time. And you can complete that with a relatively low level of physical fitness and physical preparedness. But if you want to complete 
higher tiers of hard charging and wear armor and all that, then maybe you need to work on getting in better shape. Um, then of course, there's the, uh, the aspect of eating well and being well hydrated, and you should be doing that in your daily life if you're not. Uh, and if you're not, then at least focus on that going into the event. Um, I also recommend in terms of mental preparation, you should be getting with your squad, you should be getting with your platoon if possible, and uh, communicate with all the guys who are in your squad and your platoon, uh, join the Facebook groups, get absolutely squared away, and make sure that your buddies are squared away too. Uh, hold everyone accountable uh, to making sure that they have everything that they need and that they know what they're getting into. That's actually why I'm unpacking all this stuff, because one of the things that we do at Gun Gamers and TF Keg is before every Milson West event, we take pictures of our virtual gear layout, confirming that we have all the required red line items. So, wow, that was uh, quite a lot of talking. This is probably quite a long video, but hopefully you found this in-depth deep dive helpful. Uh, hopefully you aren't bored, and if you made it all the way here, you're the real MVP. So hopefully this was helpful. And I have been E House from Gun Gamers, and I'm signing off. Peace. Hopefully, I'll see you all at Milsim West Return to Saratov, because I'm very excited. That's my return to Milsim. Ah! Thank you for watching this video from Gun Gamers. We hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. Check the description below if you'd like to buy a t shirt or a patch, and use the coupon code JUDY10 for 10% off of your next order at Amped Airsoft. Thank you again for watching and praise Judy.